It's Friday Feedback Friday, the feedback is day of the week. Ha! Hey! I actually only missed one note there. That's what happens when you practice before you start. Go me! <laughs> Sorry guys. Uh, Momo relapsed. He's still sick. He's got snotty nose. So my husband has taken him to the vet for an antibiotic shot. Because he needs something stronger than... He's on antibiotics and antiretrovirals right now. It's just a really persistent infection. He's prone to them. He, he lived outside. He had a rough start to life. So he gets these flare-ups every so often. Um, poor Momo. Uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm here to talk about your feedback for the week. For people who are fairly new. I've seen some new commenters. So this is Feedback Friday. It's where I go through the comments. Yes, I actually read the comments on my videos. I know I'm a glutton for punishment, uh, but I, uh, I respond. And this is what I do in, instead of having to go through and answer everybody's comment or just picking and choosing. I factor it into the format. I build it in so that there, there is a sense. So you guys feel heard. And uh, it also structures when I look at comments, how I engage with comments, instead of being on this console, oh, who commented now? That's unhealthy. So, uh, but if you like this sort of content where people actually read comments and respond to them and keep their comments open and don't become an echo chamber, please help support this channel, become a monthly patron, patreon.com, Leanna K, moving towards the goal of $2,000 a month in Patreon support. That is double what it was when we started this. So we are a fifth of the way there and kind of stuck. That's the way Patreon works. But uh, we will get there. It is only March. So uh, we're on track, mostly, I think. Um, but uh, comments for the week. First, I want to talk about the uh, cultivation theory video I did and, and my theory that the cultivated effects are actually on the critics of games, not the games themselves. And I was reminded again of how smart you guys are and you have an extremely in-depth understanding of cultivation theory and that makes my job a heck of a lot easier. And, um, commenter, first name Sturgid, uh, this commenter is generally a very good commenter. Their comments are always really, really insightful. Um, but they acknowledged that... I'll just read the comment. Um, Cultivation theory is based on results, but the way these results are obtained is shaky because it tests for the device through which the media is consumed, but not exactly for the media. What that means is, is well, that's not always true, but in the original Gerbner studies, yes, it was. The, the variable to test was consumption of television. Overall television hours, there was no separation made between comedy, drama, news, all that stuff. Um, we have to remember that back in the 70s, they actually had to prove any connection between watching television and impressions on the real world. They actually had, had to positively prove that it was a starting point. But those original studies, yes, the the idea of mean world syndrome was in fact just connect to all television viewing, not a specific kind. So they said, if you watch the news a lot, then you will believe the world is a lot more dangerous than it really is because you're constantly bombarded with real world examples of how it's dangerous. If, however, you mostly consume fiction, then you are not constantly bombarded with mean worldedness. It's like including that Lord of the Rings makes you angry with the world because reading exposes you to news articles. I see the point there. I'd like to offer some nuance to that. Um, I know with me... I, I do make the distinction between fiction, which is essentially philosophy with a plot, and real world news, which is messy and complicated and, and can't be arranged into a narrative easy and cleanly, uh, no matter how much the mainstream media tries to do just that. Um, I do think, though, how we process the news has a lot to do with the media 
uh, not just the media, but the influences that we subject ourselves to overall. And this has to do with worldview. And most, most people consume media for entertainment that backs up their view of the world. Uh, I, I do it a little differently. I try to consume lots of different sources, but I also try to watch um, not too much nihilistic television because I, I don't want to be influenced in that regard. I like to watch shows where hope is possible, where there are some good people involved. I don't mind flaws, but shows about terrible people wear me out very, very quickly. Uh, I had to stop watching The Walking Dead. I read the, I read Eric Kane's updates on it because it's just too nihilistic and it's not even good nihilistic. It's just, ugh. There's no hope and everyone's awful and it's too bad because there's some absolutely great actors on that show. But man, ugh. I like superhero stuff because at least they're trying, right? Same with Game of Thrones. Much better done. But, oh man, that royals are terrible and are constantly out to screw each other. One honest man in Sodom and Gomorrah kind of thing. I've seen it a million times. Um, it's well made, but I can't, I want to catch up again. I want to just do like a binge session now that it's on our um, subscriber on demand service. But, man, I can only deal with so much of that. You know, at least with something like Westworld, there's something of a hopeful message at the end. Um, with the the crappy CW shows that I know are garbage, but oh my god, they're light and colorful and funny. And and uh, Legends of Tomorrow is currently my favorite because it is funny and just dumb, and the cast is good, and it's not trying to make any great point. Um, you you forget there's sort of an existential threat to the timeline because it's just it's just goofiness. It's the modern quantum leap. Um, I do that because I find myself getting too depressed with w the way the flash has gone, which is, you know, this this team of people you really like are up against this seemingly unbeatable enemy. And the only way to victory is to pay some horrible personal cost. That's way too much like real life. People need hope. People need hope from their entertainment. And I think too much of the stuff that's considered groundbreaking television is uh, completely devoid of, devoid of hope. House of Cards is a shining example of a show that went too far into the muck. I don't know what they thought about that show. The first season was eh. The second season was really good. Um, and then it just... It's just awful people being awful in awful ways. And the narrative overall in all this stuff about politics veep is a comedy but it's the same way that only terrible people go into politics and you should only suspect you should only expect terrible things from them and they're all terrible or else they wouldn't go into politics that colors people's opinions of real life political stories and I think that it actually makes it harder for good people to get stuff done through the system. Because this idea of all politicians are corrupt, the minute you're a politician, you are automatically corrupt, except for notable exceptions, like Bernie Sanders for some odd reason isn't corrupt even though he's a career politician, his only job has been politician for 30 years. Somehow, he's still fighting the good fight, uh, even though he was to the right of Hillary Clinton on guns and then, then showed up at some of the Parkland rallies. Um, but he's apparently one of the good ones because reasons I don't know why. But then you get people like Trump, whose selling point is, I'm not a politician. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. 
He is. He runs for president. That's like saying, I put out fires, but I'm not a firefighter. I have a, a badge and a police car, but I'm not a cop. That is your job now. When you run for office, you are a politician. What he's trying to do is say, I'm not slimy like those other politicians. I know a lot of people in politics here who are essentially good people. They have to make some tough choices and, and the system is slow and frustrating and no one likes it and it's flawed. Uh, but they are essentially good people and I am not talking just people on one side of the political spectrum. Um, there are, are plenty of absolutely decent conservative politicians. Uh, you know, you start naming names and all of a sudden they're like, what? I mean, here's the thing, guys. I know them personally. You don't. John Tory, really nice guy. We used to work with, with John. John Tory is now the mayor of Toronto, but he was um, crossover. That dude will walk into a room and have like people line up to insult him and he will just take it and he will hold his head high and you can respect that even if you don't agree with all of his decisions you know how i feel nobody agrees with another human being all of the time uh you know john tory's a great guy olivia chow jack layton's widow really really wonderful person and what you do when you start talking about people like this is it's like people find the one flaw the one decision that a public person made that they didn't like and instead of disagreeing with the decision they go after their character because that's what people do in politics and if you've actually spent any time sitting down and talking to these people as people you realize that that's not that's not the sum total of who they are you know uh, the, the interesting thing is when John Tory ran for premier, I was very much opposed to his platform, you know, uh, the idea of funneling more money into religious schooling, as opposed to trying to find a way, it's near impossible, but trying to find a way to cut the funding for state sanctioned religious education, I am opposed to. And that was the, you know, that was the core of his platform. Um, so it's one of these things where I disagreed with this platform. I think he's done some interesting things as mayor of Toronto. Uh, but you know, I, I can disagree with some of the things he does or some of the way he does it and still recognize he is a good person. And that's, what's interesting when we get into political commentary, which I don't do often, but I, I do feel like it is something of a public service when something's going on, especially here, since you guys are American and, and um, uh, a lot of you don't know what goes on up here and you've expressed the fact that you'd like to know more about the way things work in other countries. And that's why I did uh, the video on uh, the Ontario election and how it basically became Canada's Trump versus Clinton. And people were like, RIP, your comment section it wasn't bad there there were a few people who just like to scream at politicians and that comes to the territory but vast majority of comments were still um good and at least one commenter actually understand uh what i was saying they said this one person who says you're guaranteeing that doug ford's gonna win this is like and he's like i'm no Ford supporter. Did I say Doug Trump? Doug Ford gonna win. I'm no Ford supporter, but I see the writing on the wall. Raw, raw taxes. Raw, raw, raw liberals. You're a Ford supporter. H how do you say I'm no Ford supporter? But it's different when I'm, you know, commenting on U.S. politics and I say, "Look, guys, I have no horse in this race. I can't vote." That's one thing. But, but you know, this is a person who can vote. You are going to vote for Ford. Fine. Everybody has to make the choice for themselves. Don't piss in my ear and tell me it's raining. You're a Ford supporter. Or at least you're a Kathleen Wynne hater. And that's fine. That's the majority opinion right now. But one person said, I think you missed the point of the Trump comparison. She isn't saying that he's exactly like Trump. But what she's getting at is the impact of this election is similar to that of Clinton versus Trump. It's about the upset of Trump's victory, not Trump himself. This isn't an endorsement. It's an examination of current history repeating itself. And that's exactly what it was. It was the fact that 
a lot of people in Canada sat back and went, ha ha, America, they have elected Trump. And Doug Ford became the, uh, the progressive conservative candidate and everybody went, uh. now we can't laugh anymore because there's a very good chance he's going to win. Now the, the big flip is that Trump had to come from behind uh, and Ford has started as the front runner, even though he has an approval rating of 36%, which is exactly like Trump's. And he's saying he's going to dismantle uh, sex ed programs because um, he's running on a socially conservative platform. But he thinks that there there should be uh, open competition for marijuana sales, says the likely former drug dealer who never got caught. Uh, and these are the sorts of things that do complicate the issue because it would be really... It, easy if we could just pick people like we pick student council president we just vote for the most popular person the person we like best but it's not that you don't have to like a person you just have to think they're going to do the best job for the prov the province or the country or whatever and that's why a lot of people voted for donald trump in the end not because they liked him a lot of them didn't and when i see Trump voters interviewed on the news. That's what they say. We don't like his tweeting. We don't like his personal behavior, but we thought he was the better choice for the country. And that's completely valid. The question is, was he? And, you know, the question is, because he was clearly a terrible choice, people either have to cling to the idea that Clinton would have been worse which I don't think you can really say right now. She may not have been great, but worse. You know, or the best way of picking a government in the world, which is representative democracy, can still fail. And that's, that's the difficult thing to face. That's the hard choice. And Things like that are what cause people to suck back and go, oh, violent video games. Video games are ruining the world. They look for these easy scapegoats because it's comforting, but it's not right. You know, instead of addressing the way we talk to each other and the fact that personal accountability has left a great many parts of modern life it's it's not about um having a nobility and having integrity and and admitting when you're wrong but not saying you're wrong just to go along to get along um you know now it's hide all mistakes because the minute you make one mistake you're the guy that gets blamed for every mistake the company makes that's what most people are living in right now and i think a lot of people looked at trump and they saw uh well this guy is just an embodiment of the way the world works. And I think that some people look at Doug Ford and think the same thing. You know, um, it's, it's complicated because he's the only one without much of a record. He does, but it's in Toronto, so a lot of people don't really know what he did. They know he's Rob Ford's brother more than anything. So people tend to avoid hard choices. And they're like, well, I don't like Kathleen Wynne. Let's give him a chance. They barely know anything about what he's promising to do. And I mean, we're we're getting double whammied here because we're like going to repeat Trump in that Doug Ford has said some disqualifyingly offensive things. He accused people of committing jihad against him because a man with an autistic son was advocating for services for his son. Doug Ford called that a jihad. Look it up. Um, the, it isn't the invocation of jihad. It's the fact that this is a guy with a very thin skin who has shown an inability to really make challenging choices. And that's the most important thing in a leader. The, their ability to be cool under pressure and make tough calls, knowing that they could very likely be wrong. Unfortunately, that's exactly what people hate 
in political candidates. Any mistakes in someone's past that they can point to that is considered disqualifying instead of, oh, they made that mistake. What I want to know is they're not going to do it again. But admitting a mistake is considered bad in politics, and so people don't do it. It drives me crazy. And so we're getting into this thing that was the most popular uh, video. This is why I left it. Uh, you like the segue here? I thought that was pretty smooth. Um, the thing about The Guardian and that god-awful article about video games and the alt-right and all that stuff. Um, again, tantalizingly easy answer. Completely wrong. Cherry pick data. I don't have time right now because I've already been talking for 20 minutes. I don't have time right now to rehash the history of Gamergate and what really happened there. Unfortunately, I saw while it was going on how the narrative was baking in. I, I tried to prevent it at deep personal cost to my career because I cared enough. I thought that there were enough people who were actually participating in good faith, I didn't want to see them get crushed under a media machine. So I tried to engage at the time and say to them, look, I get you're saying Breitbart's the only people who will listen to you, but the reason that is, is because your mouthpiece is Breitbart. They didn't get it, and I knew they didn't get it, and I got called a lot of names at the time, and, and some people even tried to dox me and stuff like that. Some people actually did dox me. I just didn't freak out about it, so it didn't spread very far. Um, but it killed me to see how that went. Because I knew the truth. I knew the people who were uh, working behind the scenes to do the more kind of proactive grassroots telling people be polite don't make personal attacks this is how you do it i saw that working in in the whole you know the consumer revolt element of gamergate that everybody claimed didn't exist it was there it just got completely blown out it got completely bowled over by the culture war elements because breitbart was a huge megaphone and all the high profile stuff got distorted through the views of a few people in the media who did have political agendas. It's not true that gaming gave rise to the alt-right. What is true is that the alt-right saw an opportunity in video games because it saw an, uh, the enemy of my enemy is my friend sort of thing. There, there were certain com enemies in common, cultural Marxists, uh, sex negative feminists. At the time, it was all feminists. Like Gamergate started off, they just fuck feminists. Everything was fuck feminists. You're a cunt feminist. This, 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 this. This is stuff I was personally uh, said. Uh, people were threatening to light my. I won't say it again, on fire in the comments when I was on Sargon of Akkad's stream. Uh, so I saw it. The thing is, I have enough experience with gaming and gamers. You know, that's not a re representative sample. That's, that's idiots engaging in some kind of weird, cathartic Lord of the Flies. I don't know. It's a performance, right? Most of those guys are probably only semi-verbal verbal around women in the real world. And I know that, but that's because I have experiences with gamers. And the problem is that it's the stigmatized thing that it is socially acceptable to run horror stories of how, you know, dude bro gamers are terrible to women, turn gamers into this, you know, big bad wolf, you know, privileged white heterosexual cisgendered man when really we're just a bunch of nerds who got picked on and so found a solitary activity that no one could tell us we were doing wrong and then we happened to get really good at it figured out how to make money at it and the rest is history um 
but, uh, sorry, phone's ringing. Um, but, uh, it's frustrating for me because I know what the truth is. And I have tried over and over and over again to keep finding ways to popularize that truth, to tell my truth, and I keep getting shut down. It's not a convenient truth right now. We live in an age of simplicity. People want simple because everything is so complex. People want easy answers. The truth of what happened in 2014 is not simple and it is certainly not easy. It's easy to say gaming led to the rise of the alt-right. It's just not to the far right. It's just not to the far right's existed as long as there's been politics. Gaming didn't create the far right. The far right has always been there. It's just history goes in waves and cycles and, and they're up right now. The extreme left, it's just an age of extremism. God, I didn't think I'd, I'd live to see the day where somebody could go, I'm a democratic socialist and have a decent showing in even the democratic primary. Like that, you guys don't understand. Even 10 years ago, that just would not happen. So it's an age of extremes. And a lot of people are feeling very lost and frustrated. And they are, come on, camera, focus. And they are looking for someone to be an adult in the room. And adulting is, you know, about as in focus as this camera was a minute ago. Um... And I get that, because the thing is, here's the thing about adulting, recognizing that periodically people are going to disappoint you. What they do about that next is the most important thing. You have to be able to give them the opportunity to correct their mistake, and that is a huge feat of strength, especially for people like us who the number one good thing we have going is our intelligence, meaning it stings a lot harder when we're tricked. Um... That's sort of where we're at right now. And that's why I think when people see absolute gobbledygook, like the stuff published in The Guardian, it pisses us off. But then the fact that people can go back and find example after example after example of the exact same gobbledygook and the people who are spewing who the people opposing the current gobbledygook won't own their own gobbledygook from the past. People do not accept that. I'm not saying. Uh, people do not accept that video games cause violence and video games glorify violence are different arguments. They're, they're really not. Why do we care if violence is glorified? Well, because it makes violence more likely. It makes violence seem okay. Uh, they're the same argument, I'm sorry. One is more sophisticated than the other, but, but they're essentially arguing something you can't prove because the truth is that violence is ugly and abhorrent and traumatizing. And the reason that, that propaganda campaigns have happened, the reason we do... Um, label uh, people in the military as heroes is because they have to go in and see crap and do crap that no one wants to do. That is heroism. Glorifying service is not the same as glorifying violence. And a lot of this anti-video game stuff is taking on a profoundly anti-war, anti-military twist to it that I'm finding uncomfortable. I, I, I am a big supporter of the people who serve. I am not a big supporter of some of the government decisions that got us into certain wars, but the people 
who go over there and and do their damn best and have to live with the both, both physical and psychological scars from that for the rest of their life. Holy crap. We they have earned our respect and we should glorify them. The glory is fighting for the right things when you have to fight, not looking for a fight. It's the whole point of going to war and being good at war is so that wars can be as short as they possibly can. If, if you ask most people who do those jobs, are you going over to take lives? Or are you going there to save lives? They will say, I'm there to save lives. And that should be respected. And I think I'm going to talk more about this on Monday because this is a much bigger topic. I'm going to stop there. But I share your concern about this narrative. I don't think people have really stopped and thought about the underlying assertions of this media glorifies violence argument. Um, but I'll stop there. Have a great weekend. Uh, thanks for watching. And uh, hope people who got whacked by that snowstorm are digging out. Wow, that was a lot of snow. Okay, everybody, thanks for watching.